We're going to do something a little bit different this morning, perhaps, than you might be accustomed to. Because I'm going to ask that we bring the lights up, and I'm coming down there. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our focus this morning is out of that language. Let's bring up Acts chapter 1, verse 9, if we can. We'll take a quick look at it again. Can we do that? When he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. We call this Ascension Day. And you heard it also referred to in the book of Luke. And believe it or not, we're also going to take a look at a verse in Ephesians chapter 1 where it's also spoken about. But you and I have been challenged and invited and committed by pastor to be focused on and to be thinking about what this means uh, when we say he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. Now there are one of three ways that a sermon can take place, a message. I can give you a lot of information about the Bible and from the Bible and about doctrine and how Christians have always understood these things. I can give you a lot of information, more than you care to handle. And you can think about it and hear it, and then you can decide whether or not you're going to apply it to yourself. That's one way of approaching a sermon. There's a second way. And I suspect, because I know your pastor, that this is mostly the way it happens between him and you and between the Lord's heart through him to you, that he knows you so well, and he knows himself, and he knows the word of the Lord. And with all of our fears and our defenses and concerns and whatnot, Pastors who know their congregation have a way of getting past all those defenses and getting inside our hearts and minds and putting his, their finger on what hurts without us even being able to understand how he got there. And then having put his finger on the hurt and, he, and you know he's there. And then he puts the bomb and the power of the gospel on it. That's another approach. There's a third way to do that, and we're going to do this this morning. I'm going to invite you to take a look at this text and think about what you think it means. And then we're going to talk about what it's really saying. And we're just going to let the Lord do this to you. And it's going to be a little bit interactive because I'm even going to ask some questions, okay? And it's okay to ask, answer, all right? Are you in confirmation class? Good, we'll put you on the spot. Sam, <laughs> I want you all to think about Sunday school also, okay? And Bible stories, everything else. Now take a look at this. Here's Jesus with his disciples on Ascension Day, and he gives them this, and, and look at what that says. When he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Now, I said at the first of the lessons, we're still in the Easter season, right? In fact, if we were upstairs in the liturgical setting, I'd have on my stole, which is white, because we're still in the Easter season. And next Sunday is Pentecost. Then we go into the whole 26 weeks where we talk about God the Holy Spirit operating in our lives to believe and know and respond to the Christian message. Now, Christ is risen from the dead. It's what we've been saying for seven or six weeks, right? All right, we said it again. Once he's risen from the dead, does he ever have to die again? Good. So the, the man, Jesus of Nazareth, is still alive, right? Right? That's not a trick question. The man, Jesus of Nazareth, is still alive, right? So where is he? If he's still alive. That's what the world would say. If he's still alive, you know, show me the money. Where is the body, okay? 
that's exactly what the, what the unbelievers couldn't prove. All they had to do to disprove Easter was to go and find the body in the tomb, but they couldn't. They had to explain it. But now Christians have a problem. If Jesus has been raised from the dead, where is he? There it is. He ascended into heaven, right? All right. He was lifted up, he ascends, and a cloud took him. Got it? Now, let's see. I'll ask you. Where are the clouds? Pretty high up, right? They're pretty low today, all right? But generally the clouds, you can't just reach up and grab a piece of cloud, can you? So if you're going to be ascending into the clouds, you probably got to get on an airplane, don't you? Or a helicopter or get something else. So it says Jesus ascended into heaven and a cloud took him. So what impression does that give you about where the man Jesus is? Way up there. This inspired Elton John to write the song Rocket Man. Okay? I'm, that's a joke. <laughs> Just saying. Now that's the impression we have because we normally think of the clouds being where? In fact, some of our fellow Christians understand that's where it is. So where's heaven? Okay? And we, then we begin to get, well, then if, if heaven's there, then where's hell? Right? Okay? And we begin to get this picture of a three-story universe that we're kind of caught in between and whatnot. And then thinkers today, oh, they believe in this three-tiered universe out of the Bible. We reject that. Okay? Therefore, we reject the Bible. Is that what that text says? Look at it. It only says that because that's the way we picture it. Because like our friend over here, here said, the clouds are way, way up there. The verb lifted up that's in the original does not mean that he took off like a rocket. It means to lift up your hands in prayer. How high do I have my hands? Not very high, right? They're not like a rocket, are they? Or like... Or it means to lift up a table so you can clean under it. How high do you lift up a table to clean under it? He's lifted up and their attention is riveted on him. And then what does it say? It doesn't say he went into the clouds. It says a cloud took him. Now everybody... From your Bible history, every time a cloud appears in the Bible, what is it a symbol of? Old Testament, book of Exodus. The people of God are led out of Egypt and they spend 40 years in the wilderness. And by night, they have an absolute visible assurance of the presence of God that is right there with them. At night, it's a pillar of fire. What is it during the day? It's a pillar of cloud. When the temple is dedicated and God comes down on the temple to claim it as his house, he comes down as a cloud when Jesus is baptized and the spirit comes down as a dove there is also a cloud she gets the sermon you get an A in theology class and a voice comes from the whose voice is that it's God the Father. When Jesus is transfigured, Peter, James, and John go up on Mount Hermon and they go into a cloud. cloud. Whose presence are they in? 
gods. On the last day, it says, when the Son of Man comes and all his angels on the clouds. So when it says a cloud took him, it does not mean that it's up there and out there. Jesus has gone into the presence of his Father. But now where's your God? You learned this in confirmation class. <laughs> Is your God everywhere present at one and the same time? You remember the word you learned in confirmation class? Wow. Omnipresent. So where's the man Jesus? In the Who's sitting right here? The man Jesus is sitting right there. When you get in your cars and head back home after a while, who's sitting in the front seat next to you? <laughs> and the Savior, physically. When you've got to go through surgery and they put you on a gurney and your family has to stay out in the waiting room, who's walking with you into surgery holding your hand? The man Jesus. When you enjoy the celebrations of life, marriage and confirmation and the births of children and all the other great joys, who's sitting at your table with you? The man Jesus. This is not some presence. He's beaming down from heaven or there only as if you think it. He's there. Or did Jesus lie to you when he said, Lo, I am what? With you. Always. Which also means then, who's in the back seat of the car with you on Friday night? <laughs> who's sitting next to you when you're doing your taxes? Who's sitting at the table with you when you have a family discussion? God. The Lord Jesus. And when we, when we lose our tempers, when we behave in ways that are less than proud, that we can be proud of, who's there with us? The Lord Jesus. And when it comes to the point where you and I have to take our loved ones out to the cemetery and leave them there, and we come back to church and we've all got one another, and we leave them out there, who's holding them? God. The man Jesus. You are never alone. You ever have these nights? You ever have a scary night? where there's lightning and thunder or you're afraid because you're not feeling good and you cry out, Mommy, Daddy, where are you? You ever go through that? Sometimes? I do. And I'm old. And you cry out, Mommy, Daddy, where are you? And they, come, they call from down the hall, I'm right here. Or maybe one of them comes running down to hold you, right? Sometimes? How many of you feel afraid in your life? How many of you feel afraid of where the world's going? How many of you yearn to know you're cared about and you're not alone in this world? What separates us from the love of God? Now, the only thing that separates us from God is sin. And Christ has come into the flesh and by his life and death and resurrection, he has overcome that separation so that you are never alone. Never. In the darkness of the night, in the isolation of a broken heart, when the bills outweigh what's in the balance of the checkbook, when kids grow up and leave home or abandon us, 
when we don't know where our children are because they've run away and they're experimenting with life and all that other stuff, who is with them? By absolute promise, the man Jesus. Because he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Never. So you're never alone. You and I are always in his arms. Now let's go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 23. Please. Make it 22. Thank you. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. What this means in ancient language is that Jesus is the Father's right-hand man. It means that God has put the entire universe, the entire universe, under the authority and control of the man Jesus. There is not a thing that happens in this universe, but that happens either because Jesus commands it or allows it. And he's your savior and he loves you. So that anything and everything that happens is a piece of him making use of that for the sake, now verse 23, for the sake of the church. Does it ever feel to you like history is absolutely out of control, like everything is going to pieces? You have no idea where this world is going. We sang that in our first song, didn't we? All the language of that first song we sang this morning has entirely to do with that absolute assurance that things are in the hands of our God. When you and I talk about the name of Jesus, it is not a magic talisman that we are using. The name of God are all the deeds of God. But all of history and nature are the deeds of God. And so God is working all of history for his purposes whether it's the everyday stuff you go through, like that young girl in school that broke your heart last week. <laughs> okay. You know the one I'm talking about. That you really like, but she just... <laughs> the bills that you've got to go through, the illnesses you're suffering that you don't even know about yet. And all the stuff we see going on in our history and our culture, that's all in the hands of God. And Jesus understands what it's like to be you. He's working all of it for the sake of his purposes that he reveals in the end. So when we say he ascended into heaven, we are absolutely being assured of it, that you and I are not by ourselves, and that Everything truly is in the hands of God. Now, the last thing I'm going to suggest to you is that momentarily you and I are going to come and receive the body and blood of Christ hidden in the elements of bread and wine. It is as if the Savior is through the communion, not just saying, I'm here, but he is saying, come here, let me hug you and let you know you are not alone. You have nothing to be afraid of. That's why we say, I believe he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Earlier today,